I really think that Hoist is going to have a rude awakening, and he's either going to need to go to school or retire. I hope he comes in to fight, because I'm going to come in to fight. I want to beat him for three rounds, him stand up, barely look out of his eyes, and say, this sport has changed. That he's going to beat me up, that he's going to do this and going to do that. Good, I'm glad he's very confident. He's somewhat old school to where I don't think he's going to pull a submission off. I don't think he's going to come close. I'm going to choke him out. I'm going to apply a submission hold. Make him quit. Help him up. Send him home. Supplements, great taste, extreme energy available at GNC stores nationwide. The 23 year old Melvin Gillard is 13 years younger than Rick Davis, making his UFC debut. All else is virtually even. So, Mario Yamasaki, our referee for this explosive battle of lightweights, and the beautiful Rochelle Leah, ready to get the action started here inside the Staples Center. Melvin Gillard. Here you go, are you uh, ready? Against Rick Davis. Are you ready? Let's go! And we are underway. Unorthodox stance for Rick Davis here early, and now he'll switch to leading with the left leg. Gallard wants to swing for the fences early. Nice low kick by Gallard there as Davis stepped in. Now Davis has been, Joe, sometimes compared to Shoney Carter in that he's unorthodox with a straight kick. He'll throw spinning back kiss, kicks, and that can mess with an opponent's psyche. For sure. Uh, Good Melvin name. Gillard, though, is so fast and explosive. He throws guys off with that athleticism. Oh. I mean, look at that. Yeah. Leap in body punch. I mean, that's about as much muscle as you can pack on 155-pound frame. It's so explosive. It's amazing. Now, the explosiveness is what has drawn comparisons to Kevin Randleman, a, a lighter Kevin Randleman. But yet, the one thing that Melvin Gillard's team wants to see him do, and that is Warren Donnelly and Josh Berkman, former competitor of his, they want to see him broaden his game. As everyone uh, gains more experience, Randy, as a true mixed martial artist. He's got to have a well-rounded game, and I think he's shown some ground fighting, but it's gotten him in trouble there, too. I think the majority of his game is in the standing position. Yeah, I and mean, you got to think, the kid's only 23 years old. It's a heavyweight battle of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belts. Gabriel Gonzaga and Fabiano Schur are mere images, but only one will break through the reflection. Our tale of the tape is brought to you by Zion's Extreme Supplements. Great taste, extreme energy.
home energy available at GNC stores nationwide. The 27-year-old Brazilian against the 31-year-old Brazilian. There is a definitive reach advantage for Fabiano Scherner, and he is the much larger of the two heavyweights. And the beautiful Jenny Lee set to get us started here at the Staples Center for this heavyweight matchup of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belts. Gabriel Gonzaga. Are you ready? Bring it on, come And on. Fabiano Scherner, and here we go. Who will look to take down first? And something tells me both of these guys wouldn't mind it being on the ground. But there's a good kick early. Uh, little cup him. check. Yep. Little cup check there. Scherner's OK. Scherner in the black and white trunks. Gonzaga in the solid black trunks. And as you saw. Nice double leg off the right quick. hand. Yeah, got got back. Scherner spins. Nice roll by Scherner. All right, interesting now that Scherner is on his back. He wants guard, but obviously Gonzaga says, all right, you know what? Let's battle on the, let's battle on the feet for a while. He didn't stay down. He didn't want to mess with Fabiano Scherner's guard there. This may be one fight, Randy, where we don't see one of these two men wanting to have control on the top. They'd rather be on the bottom in their guard. Good reversal by Scherner. They're going to take advantage of that jiu-jitsu. Scherner does a nice job of reversing here. Joe, when you get a jiu-jitsu against jiu-jitsu matchup, what separates one from the other? Well, you know what? Strikes. That's uh, that's one thing that separates. You get these two guys that have been used to competing in, uh, in just grappling. And there's a lot of situations in just grappling that don't really work. There's positions that you better you better not be there if the guys are able to throw punches and elbows at you. And it changes the, the game entirely. It's like taking a guy who's used to just boxing and entering him into a boxing and grappling situation like this. It's the same thing. It's very, it's, you, whoa, oh, beautiful connecting knee. with right. a knee. Said by Fabiano by Scherner. Scherner. Yep, Fabiano Scherner, just as you talked about the strikes, Joe, Scherner able to connect to the chin of Gonzaga with a knee. Now, Scherner is bloodied up, just, just a small cut on the forehead area, but nothing serious at all. But it is dripping a little bit of blood right now. Scherner on his back, and he has his opponent in guard. It's one of the beautiful things about mixed martial arts that we really do get to see what's effective in a real situation, as opposed to what's effective when you're only allowing striking. What's effective is when you're only allowing grappling. Because there's a lot of that stuff that's just not applicable when the guy's able to punch or elbow or, or, or strike. You get too carried away and you're just focused on the game. You get bothered with an elbow. Yeah, for sure. Focus on your boxing too much, your kickboxing too much, you get taken down very yeah. easily. It's such a complicated sport. There's so many facets to it. Again, Gonzaga wanted this fight to be back on the feet, but instead he'll dive into the guard of Fabiano Scherner midway through the first round. This fight's scheduled for three five-minute rounds. One thing, Zaga on the top. One thing is very difficult for guys on, like this to work, submit each other. Work. When you get two guys of this caliber, you get a lot of stalemate action, and oftentimes what separates them is the striking. Oh, oh kick yeah, by Scherner. Kick by Scherner from his back. Gonzaga might have got hurt there. Now Gonzaga trying to work the neck a bit. But again, Joe, as you said, their, their fine ground skills are pretty much going to neutralize each other's submission attack. We saw that with Pei DePano versus Jeff Monson. We've seen that over and over again. You get really talented grapplers, but together they just negate each other. They're back on the feet. Mazzagatti stands them up. Gonzaga backed off. Swing and a miss by Scherner. Nice, nice body, body kick. Yeah, absolutely. Scherner trying for the takedown now. Single leg. He lost it though. Ends up giving up his back. And they spin so neatly though. I mean, it, it, so patient is the art of jiu-jitsu, Randy. They do a nice job of, of biting position, spinning to a better position, kind of controlling the situation. You, know, you give uh, a lesser fighter your back. If you're the lesser fighter who gives away his back, all of a sudden you're in trouble. But Scherner knew he was just going to spin right down and pull into guard right now. A little bit of a uh, half guard utilized by Scherner on his backside. Gonzaga has been on the top pretty much throughout this first round. Two big men, Gabriel Gonzaga and Fabiano Scherner. But Scherner, the much heavier of the two. Fight! A nice mouse under the right eye of Scherner. Scherner seems to be breathing a little harder here than Gonzaga is. It's interesting, when we talked to Gonzaga before the fight, he actually predicted a win by submission, and that would be, as we talked about before, a heck of an accomplishment. Oh, he caught a knee. Yep, right to the midsection. And again, Scherner not afraid to pull guard. That'll get your attention. That'll also weigh heavily in the this goes to the third round. A little bit of side control here now for Gabriel Gonzaga. 
Notice how he's trapping that back leg so that Scherner can't roll both the guard or to a, to a knee bar. Scherner back into guard. See if these big men can push the pace here. Final few seconds of round number one. And we'll get set for round number two. Gonzaga seemed a little looser and more relaxed with his stand-up in that first round. Through good, they give through good they combinations, followed yeah. through with some nice takedowns. Schoener did some good things too. The up kick was nice. That's right. Good knees so by Schoener as well. I think Schoener's face, face kind of tells the tale for that round. Randy, speak of the Portuguese? No, no, no help there, Joe? Any help? Nothing. All right. I barely speak English. I think he's, <laughs> you know what, we, you're expecting us to argue with you right now, right? No. <laughs> I'm not looking for support. I'm just opening up. There you go. Anybody got a book I can borrow? There you go. <laughs> well, uh, you know what, I, I think Fabiano Scherner is uh, actually talking about that he's having a bit of a difficulty seeing with that mouse under his right eye. Come on, guys, Randy, you've been in that situation. Anytime the vision starts to get impaired, and unfortunately you've really been in that situation, that is a very scary thing. Yeah, when you've got to go out and see things coming at your head, vision is a big yeah. issue. Wow. No, he can fight. No, he can fight. No, he can fight. All right, well, it is. Sounds like there's a double vision issue here. No, he's saying he's seeing double vision. His corner's saying he can fight. He says he can fight. He can fight. I'm questioning that. Yeah. The last thing a fighter wants to say if he wants to continue to fight is I'm having double vision, whether he's having it or not. Yeah. So do you think he's looking for a way out? Well, I mean, if that's me sitting there, even if I have double vision and I think I want to continue, the last guy I'm going to tell I got double vision is the doc standing in front of me. Yep. Stop, That's a great huh? point, Randy. Randy, Randy if you're on the other go. side of the octagon and you see a guy on, talking about on, having double on. vision, you think hey, that hey, guy's looking for a that, way to quit? Get that bad thing off his I nose. Think, too much you know, I mean, obviously, if he has you having double fight? vision, he's concerned you about that. Okay. But if he wants to continue to fight, you don't tell on, the doc out, that you're guys. having double vision. All right, we are going to continue here in round number two. All right, you ready? You ready? Bring it on, come on! So let's see if Gonzaga tries to attack quickly, as Scherner was very hesitant to come out of his corner. This could create just a little bit of desperation in Scherner, too. He may try and turn it up. Absolutely. High Whoa. kick misses. I'll tell you what, Gonzaga's got some nice kicks. That left kick is nice. That was a nice right kick that just missed. Oh, good that job. hurt him. This may be the end. That's it. And Stop it is it. all over. It is all over, Gabriel Gonzaga. Victorious over Fabiano Scherner. There was a definitive amount of hesitation in the mind and in the heart of Scherner coming into that second round, and Gonzaga pounced right on it. Yeah, let's take a look at the replay. This is the end of the fight here. Good jab. It was a jab, actually, that hurt him. Straight, good, stiff jab, and he followed it up after he slipped with a nice right hand. Body kick, then a right hand. Gonzaga looked looser and more relaxed with the stand-up. So Gabriel Gonzaga goes to a perfect 2-0 and o in the octagon and 6-1 and one overall in his mixed martial arts career, the five-time Sao Paulo state champion and the Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. Let's get the official time and the official results once again from Bruce Buffer. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Steve Mazzagatti has called a stop to this contest at 24 seconds of the second round. For the winner by TKO, Gabriel Natal Gonzaga. Crown the King, Militich product Spencer Fisher has finally achieved a level where he can focus full time on fighting. A late change means he faces newcomer Wat Maiman, who could hardly breathe when he received word he was fighting. Tale of the
Tape, brought to you by Zion's Extreme Supplements, Great Taste Extreme Energy, available at GNC stores nationwide. Spencer the King Fisher, eight years the elder of handsome Matt Wyman. Now, Wyman is taller, but interestingly enough, he does not have the reach advantage. So there he is, the best in the business, Big John McCarthy, our referee for this lightweight confrontation here at the Staples Center between handsome Matt Wyman making his UFC debut and Spencer the King Fisher. All right, here we go, gentlemen. Are you ready? Are you ready, Spencer? Get it on, let's go. They touch, and I have a feeling this might be a good old-fashioned brawl. The Southpaw Fisher. Good knees. See, Matt Wyman immediately wanted to clinch. Did not want to stand up there and trade blows at Spencer. Some jiu-jitsu and stand-up in the background of Matt Wyman. Of course, the Militich fighting systems and the MFS elite team work absolutely everything. Good use of the knees again. Spencer in his last bout, as you were saying before, lost 20 pounds in short notice, but was also fighting a really talented stand-up fighter in Sam Stout. Uh, you, you know, I mean, you're talking about a guy who was uh, a K-1 level kickboxer, and Spencer still hung in with him, even though being severely dehydrated. You spent your entire life, Randy, losing weight, cutting weight, obviously, for wrestling competition as well as UFC fights, but to lose 20 pounds in two days, I mean, it just tears the body inside. Oh, yeah, it? especially oh, with a guy me. this size. I mean, a guy under 170, 180 pounds to lose 20 pounds. That's a huge percentage of his body weight. And so there's a right and a wrong way to do everything, and that's certainly not ideal conditions. For kind of well, the, the thing is, is you give him credit for it because he came in and answered the call when our matchmaker Joe Silva needed a late man to fight against Sam Stout. And now Handsome has him on his back, and they are down on the ground. Handsome Matt Wyman inside the guard of Spencer the King Fisher. Mike Goldberg, Joe Rogan, Randy the Natural Couture. Here, Octagon side at the Staples Center in Los Angeles. Yeah, that was a good takedown by Wyman. And uh, Spencer Fisher is a very active guard, very dangerous off his back. You don't see that from a lot of guys who are such good strikers, but uh, he, he's excellent in all positions. Wyman good seems to know where he wants to be here. Guillotine. Ooh, guillotine to choke. Looking That's to finish. Tight. Can he get it? He's got that tight. It's tough to see where his other hand is. Oh, he's got it deep. He oh, he's got right it very deep. That. that is very tight. Can Wyman he's got finish it? Very here. deep, and he's got a full guard. This is a bad spot for Spencer Fisher. Can Wyman finish oh, Spencer Fisher? No. Out. But gives Fisher his gives it back. back. Fisher breaks through, but Wyman's still in a great position. <laughs> Fisher's recovering here. That was a very tight guillotine. Yes, for sure. He's got both hooks and he's still controlling the back. Midway through our first of three five-minute rounds here. Lightweight division. Matt Wyman in the brown trunks. In the black and blue trunks, Spencer the King Fisher, and he's going for the choke again. He's under the neck. Spencer's doing a good. It's very difficult to get a rear naked choke in a guy if they know how to grab those gloves and move him around. It makes it much more difficult than with no gloves. Long time to work if you're Matt Wyman well, trying to get the anaconda position. around his waist. This yeah. is very difficult to get out. It's hard to breathe. But Spencer did the right thing in rolling towards the knee where the foot is tucked under. That puts a lot of pressure on the ankle, and it's hard to keep pressure on the waist when you're doing that. What Matt wants to do is roll him the other way so that his right knee is on the ground and his, his foot is up in the air. So he can really squeeze that anaconda, that body triangle down. And what is Spencer's best defense here? Spencer's got to keep hand fighting and not let him get that neck in. He's got to stay on that side. And now you see Matt changing the angle of that body lock. Oh, trying to lock it again. The king is in trouble here. Handsome Matt Wyman trying to finish with a choke. Spencer's doing a very good job of defending here, though. This is just across the jaw. It's, it's painful, but it's not going to stop him. And he spins away again. Nice control almost by out. He's almost out. He's got and he's up. Wow. Great Spencer job, Fisher, by keeping Spencer his control Fisher. Fisher. Doing a nice job. And a smile on the face of Matt Wyman. And Spencer. Unintentionally, both men met temple to temple there, but neither seems damaged. Put me inside, by Spencer. Wyman's smart, he knows where he doesn't want to be, and that's out in striking range with Spencer Fisher. He gets right to clinch, doing a nice job from the clinch, using the fence to limit Fisher's mobility. And now Fisher trying to work it. The ability to overcome 
is such a great quality to have as a mixed martial artist in overcoming multiple submission attempts here in the first round, Spencer the King Fisher. Matt is doing a really good job in his Octagon debut. He's not showing any signs of wilting under pressure and uh, doing a great job in sticking to his game plan. Nice composure by Spencer Fisher, holy moly. Yeah, that was a tight guillotine. And now Spencer working nice elbow inside the guard of Matt Cut him Lyman. open, too. Cut him open with that elbow. Yep. That's going to be an issue for his vision, Matt's vision on the bottom. What a way to finish round one for Spencer Fisher, who was in deep trouble on multiple occasions to open up his opponent, Matt Wyman. Spencer Fisher with a little jig in there. Wow. Yeah. Matt Wyman is bloodied up. That was a nasty elbow. I think it's a forehead cut. Which, uh, you know, forehead cuts bleed a lot. Hey, come on. Come on, dude. You got to open up on your feet. You got to open up. Let's take a look at the replay. Left hook. This is the elbow that did the dip. Boom, nice. Bang. Right in the yep. yep, you see it bleed immediately. Here's another look at it right here. Nice elbow by Spencer Fisher from the guard. Rotates his back of his hand to his chest and brings the point of that elbow right out. Back. You took that round. Matt, you pull one more bull crap like that, I will disqualify your ass. You got it? Yes, sir. Knock it off. But it, Spencer Fisher I'm, getting a chastising from Big John for his antics at the end of the round there, shoving his opponent and, and kind of doing the little jig there. And now McCarthy also talking to Matt Wyman and delivering the same message, Randy. So he fairly delivered the same message to both fighters. I think that's wise. You got to nip that sort of thing in the butt now before it gets out of control. Now it's interesting that some say that Spencer made it a bit personal at the weigh-in. Fisher said, I'll welcome you to the UFC tomorrow. So there were some words yesterday at the weigh-in, and now it looks like the battle is on. They're talking to each other. Absolutely. Can't hear what they're saying. Yeah, come on. Both guys smiling but taunting each other just a little bit. Nice inside, inside kick. kick. Holy cow. And you know what? I think they're going to let it go here now, too, guys. Because they're both a little fired up, and they both want to swing for the fences, make the other one look really, really bad. Nice kick again by Spencer. Yeah, Spencer Fisher just has great stand-up. I don't think Wyman needs to be under here, take more yeah. of those elbows. Now, it's a family affair for Spencer Fisher. Josh Nair, his teammate, rents a room from him, and Spencer has taught his young daughters already to uh, utilize the armbar at home. <laughs> Good thing to teach them. Don't have to worry about them on their dates. You got it. They're very nice, Randy. And now a very aggressive Spencer Fisher. I think that cut has turned the tide here. Spencer Fisher, a lot of confidence now, really opening up. Some classic ground and pound, landing some nice elbows. Matt's doing a good job of keeping him in his guard, but it's not keeping Spencer from dropping punches and elbows on him. You know, during my preparation for this fight, I was talking to our matchmaker, Joe Silva, and he said, not only does Fisher have great hands, but he has great submissions. And oftentimes when you have great submissions, it also, Joe, leads to having great submission defense, which is what got him through the first round. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, uh, that guillotine was very tight. Uh, guys with less composure would have tapped. So he continues here in the second. He earned some valuable points at the end of the first, opening up his opponent, Wyman. And now, so far, has been the aggressor here in the second. I think Spencer Fisher smells something here. He was dominating that top position. He was willing to stand up and let Wyman back up. I think he wants to continue oh. to open this up. Good combination. Wyman oh, says, oh, nice. oh, me! And Matt Wyman is wow. down! And it is Wow! Over. Wow! He that shook was... his head, no! And Fisher said, yes, my son! It is all over! Wow! That was like a fullback running for the goal line at one yard away, jumped over him. Jumping knee, and as soon as he landed it, he walked away. He knew. And there's a guy who's landed that before. He landed that flying knee right on the button and knew the fight was over. And Wyman was still shaking his head and, you know, that non-verbal back and forth a little bit with Fisher when, boom, he got caught. Well, he got cracked with a punch right now before watch, he's shaking his head and tried no, to say Joe, it was like, okay. Yeah. Oh, left knee right and to he the even, And he even, Randy, lifted his right arm as to say, hey, bro, I'm all right. He took his arm away from his face. And boom! They've left himself exposed. Ooh. Wow, that was a devastating knee. Look, see? Bam! Wow. That is real mixed martial arts right there. Just a, a, an excellent combination of all skills. Matt Hughes very happy with that performance by his teammate Spencer Fisher. 
Look at Matt, he just loves it. Spencer the King Fisher, once again, sorry Randy, crowned victorious here tonight in the UFC. Wyman being attended to, he is fine. And Fisher ups his overall record to 19 and two. Here's Bruce Buffer. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Big John McCarthy has called a stop to this contest at one minute, 43 seconds of round number two. For the winner, by knockout, Spencer the King Fisher. A ground wizard. He was the first man to defeat Chuck Liddell in the octagon tonight. Jeremy Horn fights at 185 against Chael Sonnen, an up-and-comer from Team Quest. It's our tale of the tape. It's brought to you by Zion's Extreme Supplements. Great taste, extreme energy, available at GNC stores nationwide. This is a pretty darn even matchup between the American Horn, the fellow American Chael Sonnen. All right, so a battle of 185-pound fighters, well-decorated in all disciplines. Chael Sonnen and Jeremy Horn here tonight in Los Angeles. There's Chael Sonnen fighting out of West Lynn, Oregon, and Jeremy Horn, who now calls home Salt Lake City, Utah. You ready? Come on. And we are set to go. Horn can strike. Horn can submit just about anybody and he is extremely comfortable on his back. Beautiful takedown by Chael. We saw that with Trevor Prangley. I mean, he's a, just a great wrestler. Very, very smooth. It's a southpaw. He's, got, he's been working a lot on his stand-up skills. Chael Sonnen, a realtor and an elected public official. Precinct member District 22. Did you vote for him? <laughs> of course. Of course, absolutely. Jeremy is working the open guard. So those heels on his hips that allows him to create some space when Chael raises up the punch. Yeah, Jeremy's very good at avoiding damage from the bottom. He's uh, very smart in how he controls the uh, his opponent's upper body. i surprised to see Jeremy dropping a few elbows from that bottom position, which is a very unusual place for throwing elbows from. He's good at it. Sonnen trying to work, and it is difficult to work, as you guys mentioned, nice from inside the guard of Jeremy Horn. Nice elbow by Sonnen there. This fight was supposed to happen in Anaheim about six, eight weeks ago, but they meet tonight here at the Staples Center. Good connection once and twice by Sonnen over the long legs of Jeremy Horn. You talked about all the smaller shows that Jeremy Horn has fought over the years, Joe, and uh, he has held or still holds about 15 titles in those various shows, and guillotine. now he's looking to try to finish with the guillotine show. I saw how he kept doing that with going towards his right side. Jeremy's got a good guillotine, that is deep. Can he finish Sonnen here? Will Horn submit Chael Sonnen? Chael's been in this guillotine before. This is how he lost the last time him and Jeremy fought. So you see Chael fighting hands there, but Jeremy's a wily competitor on the bottom there. You definitely have to watch him. What does Jeremy have to do to close it here, Joe? Well, he's doing what he has to do. He's got him in full guard. He's that it's a bad spot for Chael Son. I mean, he, the only hope here is that Jeremy gets tired. Jeremy's got the, the hands held together, got the fingers on the fingers, and Chael now he gets lets clear go. here. Chael, Chael did gets a real clear. good job pushing his hand down, getting some space. Good elbow from the bottom, just like Randy was just talking about. So a nice Jeremy. job done by Chael Sonnen to break through. Chael does a nice job of staying composed. Again, that was a nice tight guillotine. There is nobody wilier than, than Jeremy Horn. He's just, we call him Gumby for no, you know, no other reason than he's just very tricky down there and flexible. I mean, longtime welterweight champion Matt Hughes will tell you over and over again that about 70 or 80 percent of what he has learned, especially on the ground, has been courtesy of Jeremy Horn. This fight scheduled for three five-minute rounds. Horn on his back right now in the red trunks. Chael Sonnen work, guys. from Team Quest is in the white trunks. 
little red and camouflage for Jeremy Horn. They've got to keep busy on the ground, or Herb Dean will stand these two fighters up. Let's fight. Let's work. There you hear Herb Dean telling both to push the pace. All the way up. But for Sonnen, and he understands this, you have to be extremely cautious when you're trying to work yourself into a favorable position against watch Jeremy Horn. Here. He's got to watch an arm bar here. Exactly my point, Randy. Because if you leave a limb exposed, Horn will jump all over it. He'll lull you to sleep. Ties you up and frustrates you and gets you to overextend yourself. And makes you know you find yourself in trouble. He's really doing a good job of avoiding damage in the bottom here. I mean, uh, a lot of young fighters can learn from Jeremy Horn's technique on the ground. He really is very smart in uh, how he avoids damage and how he keeps the guy on top from ever getting comfortable enough where he can land clean punches and elbows. Keeps using his heels on those hips and can we create that space and can we control that distance. Keeps overhooking those arms, keeps him tied up. So he can land a shot. Herb Dean's going to stand him up. Only 27 right, seconds right. remains right. in round number one. And a good kick early by Chael Sonnen. And a takedown. Horn back to his backside. And Sonnen is inside the guard. And the final seconds of round number one are going to quickly tick away. The end of the first round. Horn was the one who came close to finishing this fight in round number one. It, you know, it's very interesting how judges are scoring fights these days, and I'm not exactly sure what the criteria is. With Chael Sonnen, you have two takedowns. With Jeremy Horn. Horn, you have one near submission. Okay. And I think they're way, you know, Sun had spent the majority of the round on top. And even if nothing happens and you're on top of the guy, most judges are looking at that as a dominant. Yes. Let's take a look at the replay, some of the action from that first round. Here's some punches from Chael Sun on the top. Not None of them landing really cleanly. And here is that guillotine. You see Jeremy keep reaching for that side. And finally catches Chael's neck. Controlling Chael's arm and gets a hold of his other arm. Locks in that tight guillotine choke. But Chael's son able to uh, hang in there and uh, avoid the submission. In spite of all the experience that Horn has, many will still tell you he's not a guy who's going to knock out his opponent. You trained for a long time with Chael's son and how advanced has, uh, well, we see it go right to the ground, so it's almost a, a, a mute question now, but how advanced have his hands become? Well, he's a good athlete. He's got great athletic ability, and he uses his hands very well, but he, he again, his wrestling is his base. Right. It's his background. When push comes to shove, that's what he's going to rely on. And Joe, Jeremy, we've talked about it. Yeah, again. Arm he's got bar it again. Up. Does he have it this time? Oh, this doesn't look good for Chael right deep. here. Trying to slip it. He is a, he is a wizard on the ground. Yeah, Sonnen trying to slip that arm out. He's trying to punch him and, and get him to let it go. Jeremy let it go. Jeremy Horn did let the arm He's go. He's still in danger, though. Still in danger. Jeremy's trying to switch to an omoplata there. Now he's looking to, for a triangle. If he can get his right leg tucked under his left knee, he's got a triangle here. He's got that one arm in. Jeremy knows it's there. Sonnen doing a good job of staying postured up here, not letting Jeremy suck him down into yeah. this triangle. Yeah, real good job. And that's one thing you notice about wrestlers. They have amazing posture and, uh, and core strength, which really helps in avoiding a triangle submission. Sonnen's got to pay attention here, though. He's going to get the side. trouble. From one to the other attack. Attack. It's all over. Wow. Armbar victory, Jeremy Horn. Very From one sneaky. submission attempt to another, bam, it's all over in the ground. Wizard is victorious. Very sneaky armbar right there. Let's take a look at the end of that round. Jeremy Horn just came over and gave us a look. Look at this. Beautiful submission. It's like a triangle in front. And he's just he had a scream tap. Yeah, absolutely. Stop. Please yeah, let, stop. Let's look at that again. That is a very interesting submission here. He's in the guard. It looked like he was looking for a triangle and then switched it to the front. See, he's got a triangle in front, traps both of his arms inside, and he's got an arm bar in there. Very interesting and creative position. It's like yoga. And look from at the, the locker guys. room. Yes, very excited. A great night for the Militich camp is Jeremy Horn, reigns supreme 
with the armbar victory here in the second round against Chael Sonnen. Bruce Bumper. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Herb Dean has called a stop to this contest at 1 minute 17 seconds of the second round. For the winner by tap out due to an arm bar, Jeremy Hall. He found fame and he hopes newfound fortune after surviving the ultimate fighter house. Mike Quick Swift collides with the Diesel Joe Riggs, just 23, but a five-year vet moving back up to 185. Our tale of the tape brought to you by Science Extreme Supplements, great taste, extreme energy, available at GNC stores nationwide. The 26-year-old American against the 23-year-old born American, and there is a definitive reach advantage. Mike Quick Swick not only does it with the hands, he does it with the feet, and this time a kick sets up the submission victory. And when your opponent is already wobbled as he was there, that's when you can zero in and finish him quickly as Mike Swick once again lives up Outside to his pitch. moniker, Bruce Buffer. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Mario Yamasaki has called a stop to this contest at two minutes, 19 seconds of the first round. For the winner by tap out due to a guillotine choke, Mike Quick Swift. Let's move ahead on the card. Heavyweight competition, truth be told, Brandon Vera has been anointed by some as the next big thing. His combatant, another big Brazilian, Asuario Silva, who has fought all over the world, is experienced and successful. Our tale of the tape is brought to you by Science Extreme Supplements. Great taste, extreme energy, available at GNC stores nationwide. The American Vera, 28 years old, three years younger than the much thicker, if you will, Brazilian Asuario Silva. Now, 226 and 234 don't look that much different. Silva is much stockier in his build. Our referee in charge of this contest is big. John McCarthy. Ah, the best in the business, Big John McCarthy, our referee for this collision of heavyweight fighters here tonight. Unfortunately, uh, you know something about that, don't you? And that sort of thing happens. <laughs> it, it happens all the time. In training, it happens. So. It's amazing it doesn't happen more often. You think about the open finger gloves. Let's take a look at that right here. Oh, yeah. Finger went right in the eye. Of course, that stopped the fight with you and Vitor Belfort. Yeah, you know, in the corner. a little in the bit corner. different than I caught a slice on the island. Correct. A very weird place to get. But. Let's take another look at that. See, Asuario dropped down but left his head wide open. Brandon got a hold of it, grabbed that fist, tucked that forearm deep into Asuario's neck, full guard, and got the tap. Got Asuario's arm trapped in between his legs on the far side, which yeah. is the hand he needs to fight hands with to get out of that guillotine. Yeah, that that was a bad spot. Michael Clark Duncan, a regular here at the Ultimate Fighting Championship, and he loves those men who choke people out. Right now, let's move ahead to the welterweight division. Canadian John Alessio was just a tender-footed youth when he first entered the UFC. And now reshaped and redefined, Ultimate Fighter 1 champ Diego Sanchez hopes to leave his mark. Our tale of the tape for this welterweight matchup, brought to you by Zines Extreme Supplements, great taste, extreme energy, available at GNC stores nationwide. It's the young man from Albuquerque, New Mexico, Diego Sanchez, 24 years old, against John Alessio from Vancouver, British Columbia, now fighting out of Los Angeles. Everything else is virtually even. Steve Mazzagatti will watch over our two welterweights, Diego Sanchez. Ultimate Fighter 1 winner in the middleweight division, and John Alessio making his second appearance right, in the up. UFC. You ready? Bring it on! Come on! Been a long time in waiting for John Alessio to get back here. And he is a much different man than he was way back at UFC 26 in June of 2000 when he fought for the title against Pat Militich. If this fight stays standing, look for John Alessio's jab. He's got an excellent jab. Really good boxing skills. In here. Nice, nice take sprawl. Down Nice sprawl by Alessio. Now, Diego also has worked his boxing. He has some of the coaches from the De La Hoya team working with him now. The 96 Olympic boxing coach. Diego.
Nagel in the orange trunks, Alessio and the white and black trunks, sizing each other up early, looking to engage. Interesting against a southpaw, that jab's not going to be terribly effective in, in a southpaw versus an orthodox fighter. I don't know if that'll hamper Alessio at all. Right hand will be a much more effective tool. Alessio spent some time in Detroit at the Crown Boxing Gym where, as he said, there are just stud boxers that have concentrated on their hands for years. So uh, it, it may be Alessio who has the advantage with the hands, but as we said, Diego has really been working his, and we know what he can do on the ground as he showed us during the Ultimate Fighter Reality Series. Diego may be looking to set up for the shoot here. Yep, single leg, and he can't get it again. Nice defense by Alessio. Yeah, it certainly appears like Diego's trying to utilize the hands to set up the takedown. As he, he has to. You have to engage a guy in the striking realm and be that close to a guy if you want to have any hope of taking him down. And the best hope he has of taking John Alessio down is getting John to commit to some punches so he can dive underneath him. And Diego grabs a leg again and another fine sprawl by Alessio. Diego having a hard time taking down John Alessio. Let's see if he can sweep the other leg. Something I've seen Randy Couture do a number of times. Alessio's Alessio looking for, the for Kimura. Kimura. Yeah. Diego having an extremely difficult time taking down Alessio here in the first couple of minutes of round one. Wow. Alessio's got the Kimura standing up there. And, and Diego. Diego switches. Using yep. this nice as an escape more than anything, I Wow, think. that's 0 for 3 in takedown attempts if you're scoring at home. So far, what Billy Russ was talking to me about is proven to be correct. John Alessio, a far more difficult competitor than the odds would say. Don't forget, we mentioned it earlier, bitter rivals will meet at UFC 61, Saturday, July 8th, Mandalay Bay Event Center, 10 in the East, 7 in the West, Ortiz Shamrock 2. Tim Sylvia and Andre Arlovsky once again will fight for the heavyweight title. Tickets go on sale tomorrow. Mandalay Bay Box Office, Ticketmaster.com, and UFC.com. Tito and 10, can't wait to see it again. Nice jab by Alessio. Diego absorbs it, immediately shoots in. There's a limp arm out. Wow. Alessio does a nice job of getting out of there. And the more times John Alessio does this, the more his confidence is going to go up. And the, the more frustration. Yeah, very exactly. nice, Randy. Touche. The more frustrated Diego Sanchez is going to become. And, and it's pretty apparent now, Randy, that Diego feels like his best chance to win this fight is on the ground. And he's showing that a little too much. I think right. he has to be a little more willing to engage in the striking realm in order to set these takedowns up. He's diving Call him, double, double, double. He's throwing a fake with a punch, getting John to cover up and immediately shooting down and grabbing the leg, but John is doing such a good job of avoiding the takedown. Now, Diego was very complimentary of John Alessio, saying in the pre-fight interviews he's known for a long time, and he realizes that Alessio is very Get good at everything. Trying to use submissions there, displaying the point that we brought up. Nice hand control by Alessio. It's really hard to take a guy down with one hand. He reaches across and controls that far hand in a Kimura or a wrist control. It allows him to stand up and get out of there. Mike Goldberg, Joe Rogan, Randy the Natural Couture. Here at the Staples Center in Los Angeles, UFC 60. Already seen two strong victories for Mike Swick and Brandon Vera, both via the guillotine choke. Now we have welterweights and John Alessio and Diego Sanchez. Alessio's looking to set up this right hand. Final 30 seconds, and coming up empty with a takedown attempt again is Sanchez. Here comes the right hand. And really, there's nothing that leads me to believe that Diego's going to be any more successful the next time he goes to shoot. Unless, again, he's willing to move into that range of exchanges where he can be hit and hit Alessio. He's not distracting him enough to get in deep and take him down. Good combination by Alessio. Diego covers the face. And a good first round for the very elusive John Alessio. Yeah, great first round. He did exactly what he wanted to do. He avoided the takedown. He established dominance standing up. Got to be very frustrating for Diego Sanchez. It, it, well, some of the odds that I've seen listed him as much as a 4-1 to favorite in this fight. All right, coming up later tonight, it is our main event of the evening. As Matt Hughes, the most decorated 170-pound fighter in the history of mixed martial arts, puts his reputation on the line against UFC Hall of Famer, the one, the only, Hoyt Gracie.
That is our main event here tonight from the Staples Center. Eddie Bravo, your thoughts and your scoring for round one. Very, very close round. Um, neither fighter, fighter connected too much standing, although John Alessio did connect um, two left hands and a right hand right there at the end of the round. Um, Diego didn't land anything, although he was more of the aggressor, but those takedowns, they weren't even close. So I'm going to give a slight edge to John Alessio, 10-9. Eddie Bravo, thank you very much. Eddie joining us to help us score the fights throughout the evening and throughout every Ultimate Fighting Championship. Second round. Grabs a leg. Beautiful speed there by Diego. Throws that punch and immediately shoots down. But again, it seems uh, it seems as if the frustration will continue to set in for Diego. Yeah, nice Jonathan. sprawl, nice sprawl, keeping his hips square as Alessio. Oh, man. Very impressive takedown yep. defense by John Alessio. Alessio with the left, he could have really delivered a tough knee to Diego in that position. He just gave it, uh, Diego a big smile. Randy, I know it didn't happen very often in your career, but when you fail and fail and fail again to go for the takedown, what goes through your mind? Oh, it's frustrating. You spend a lot of energy there. The first time I fought Pedro Hizzo, time and time again, trying to take him down, take him out of that striking realm. It's, it's frustrating as heck. Will he get him this time? Gianti, let it go. Now well, he's on top. Well, at least he's on top. And now we'll see if Diego can utilize some ground and pound. Alessio, right wow, back up. Right back up. Nothing. That was a lot of effort. And Diego did. Oh, oh big nice jab. Left. Alessio's starting to find his range here. Diego Sanchez is a perfect 16-0 in his mixed martial arts career. John Alessio is one of the first guys that I ever saw in mixed martial arts really utilize an effective jab. And he just got caught yep. with the left hand. Diego came forward very nicely that time. Didn't look to set up a takedown with the hands. He was just going to deliver a hand. And he delivered the left-handed the left jab into the chin of John Alessio. Fight is scheduled for three five-minute rounds. And it looked more like that time, Randy, Diego was willing to eat a punch in order to gain the takedown. Yeah, I think throwing the double jab, landing the left hand the way he did, is going to make Alessio think about it the next time he changes levels and steps in there. Is he going to punch me or is he going to shoot? Diego's got a cut over his right eye. Looks like it's coming from that jab, yep. Alessio. Alessio tried to hit that exact spot again there, Joe. Sanchez, uppercut misses. Now Diego looks to say, all right, you know what? I've had all this boxing training. Takedowns aren't working. Maybe I will try to throw some strikes. He's got the open hand defense mode, though, as pretty much does Alessio, though. Mazzucati trying to keep him busy. Diego eats one again and escapes another takedown attempt. We have not seen someone so slippery against Diego Sanchez. The one thing that uh, Diego has going for him is that John Alessio has no idea if he's going to punch or if he's going to take him down, whereas he knows for sure John Alessio just wants to stand and strike. So he's not worried about any takedown defense. Diego doesn't have to worry about John trying to take him down. So he's just got to concentrate on figuring a way to either land punches or fake the punches and take him down. And again, right hand. It seems here as if Diego Sanchez is becoming more confident in the stand-up game. That could be a mistake. John Alessio definitely has superior hands. Hey, how about this? For the first time ever, UFC fights are available on demand. See classic fights from UFC 1 to present day, available through UFC On Demand. The website is video.ufc.com. And tomorrow, you can catch the untelevised preliminary fights from tonight's UFC 60 at video.ufc.com. UFC Video On Demand. Good jab just landed by Alessio. Oh, he snaps that out there, doesn't he? Like I said, in his fight with Chris Brennan, that was probably the most effective use of a jab I ever saw in a mixed martial arts bout. He's, uh, he's got great hands. These men came up through the smaller circuits together. They know each other very well. Alessio from Vancouver, British Columbia. Started back in a garage in Canada doing kickboxing and jiu-jitsu. Beautiful takedown defense by Alessio. That guy is very elusive. Now we want to see Alessio get more offensive, though, don't you, Randy? Yeah, I think he needs to turn it up a notch and really, really, I mean, it's frustrating him by not allowing the takedowns. 
but really do some damage now. Step in there, club him a few times, he's take some risk. He's not going to win a fight, at least clearly in the judges' minds, by just avoiding takedowns. He's got to gain some control here, does Alessio. And Diego the same. Somebody's got to push the pace and, and leave an indelible mark if indeed this is going to go the distance. And it appears at least as if we'll have two rounds in the books. Yeah, it would be nice if Alessio added some more to his game here. Not just the jab, but perhaps kicks, perhaps tricking Diego and taking him down. Something has to change for both fighters for them to be crowned victorious at the Good end job. of three rounds. All right, Joe, deep breaths and relax. Okay, now it's going to come down to this round, okay? That's a we pretty nice gash over the eyes. Yeah. This is going to come down to this round, do you understand? This round. Let's take a look at the replay and see some of those left hands that did that damage. I want you to rush him against that fence and I want you to do 30 boxes. You want elbows in. Bang, right there. That one, that was the first one that cut him. And there another one. Catches Diego with his head up. Okay. Just give me a good double, but you got to get right on top of him. He thinks he's found your rhythm. You have to move forward, and you have to punch. Eddie you Bravo. Move forward. Yep. Another really close round to, to, to score. Um, Alessio, Alessio landed six or seven jabs, opened up a cut on the top of Diego Sanchez's eye. But Diego was a lot more aggressive. He got the takedown. He's, he, he looks like he's going for the You're kill. Ready? He wants his fight a little bit more. So I gave that round to Diego. Ten. All right, so Eddie has it even so far at 10-9 each, and so as Greg Jackson, Diego's trainer, said, it may very well come down to this third and final round. Who's going to distinguish themselves in this round to win this fight? You're undefeated in the octagon, or part of undefeated in the octagon, yes, and in your mixed martial arts career. you got to let it go right here if you're Diego Sanchez. And if you're John Alessio, Diego's the one who's got a lot of the hardware right now, so you might have to really uh, do something to defeat him. Diego, combinations trying to come forward. John is doing a good job of avoiding it, but he's not doing such a good job of establishing dominance, taking over, and where, what is his strength in striking? It's almost as if in the first round he had some offense, but now he's almost gone into purely a don't get hit, don't get taken down mode. He's giving Diego a lot of respect here. He stuffed his takedowns over and over, and I think that gave him the confidence to open up a little more, and he's just not really opening up at this point. So let's see what Diego can do, if oh. anything. High kick blocked by Sanchez. Sanchez really trying to close the distance now. Diego pushes in, and Alessio steps out. He ate a big jab coming in there. You'd like to see Alessio throw that knee, wouldn't you? I'd like to see Alessio throw right hands as well. Follow that jab with a right. Sanchez was waiting for. What can he do with it? Trying to stay on the backside of John Alessio. Diego Sanchez. Like a rat Great on a cheeto, this guy. He's not going to let that go. A la Matt Hughes, Frank Trigg. Can Diego take the back of Alessio in a standing position and finish this fight? Alessio's doing a good job of controlling Diego's wrist. Diego trying to rock and, and find a way to wobble him over. Here comes the chess match now. For those who don't understand what's happening at home, Diego Sanchez trying to free that arm to come around and finish this with a rear naked choke. As long as Alessio has a hold of Diego's arm, he's in no danger of being choked. Now he's pulled over to his corner. He's getting advice from his corner and from Jeremy Horn. He's like, what do I do here? <laughs> I grab the arm, put it here. They're, they're, they're showing him. He's standing there talking to his corner, and they're explaining to him the best way to get out of it. It's amazing. Diego has a body triangle now. Look at John Alessio. He's trying literally. to arm bar him against his own head. Yep. Literally standing right next to his training team, as Joe pointed out. Yeah, this is exactly what he's trying to do. He's trying to get an arm bar right there. If Diego oh, he's carrying an armbar. Oh, Diego. Oh, did he get the arm free? 
No. Nope. Still got control of that one wrist. He almost got the left arm free there, Joe and Randy, but not able to do so. Diego's good, doing a good job with that body triangle of keeping him from rolling him over. He can hold that position, hold on his back there. And look at Alessio now trying to block Diego's punches with Diego's own left arm. He's still trying to tap him with that arm. Diego has to be getting clearly frustrated here, but there's no way he's going to give up this position on the back of Alessio. And, and keep in mind, Alessio is carrying about a 180-pound fighter for the last minute and a half. But Diego's spending a lot of energy as well trying to keep and suspend his body weight up there. These guys are slippery. That's not a good place to be. Diego cannot hold on to the fence, but there's no way Diego's letting go. Diego Sanchez continuing to try to work for the rear naked choke. This is the longest time I've ever seen a guy standing on a guy's back like this before. This, uh, you know what? This redefines piggyback ride. This truly redefines that. We need another pair of fighters in there. I have a chicken fight. You got that right. <laughs> Trying to get the right arm in now. Got the left free. But now Alessio tying up the right arm. Only 33 seconds remains, and now Alessio's doing the same thing with the right arm of Diego's that he was doing with the left arm before. This is a new one for us, Joe, and we've seen a lot of these together. Yeah, this is very unusual, and he keeps trying for that arm bar on the right arm, now on the right arm. This is something you will not see on the Randy Couture home video and the tutorial. Only 10 seconds to go. It looks like the fight is going to wound up being finished in this spot. Diego well, landing some punches here now. This may very well be the fight, actually. That may be the fight right there. That may very well have won the fight for Diego Sanchez. Absolutely. What a job done by Alessio. He put on defense like the 1985 Chicago Bears on Diego Sanchez. Eddie Bravo, he teaches jiu-jitsu. He's got all kinds of crazy jiu-jitsu, but that had to be new to you as well, Eddie. Yeah, that was pretty crazy. Like Joe said, I've never seen a fight last that long with uh, someone riding a, a, a guy's back. Um, it was, uh, that round was pretty clear in my card. On my card, it was clear, like, whoever won the last round is going to take this fight. And Diego was on Alessio's back for, like, three minutes, a better part of that round. You got to go with Diego Sanchez, 29-28. We have seen some weird scoring before, and you got to think that the second round was kind of debatable. It was a very close round. You could, could you see this possibly going to John Alessio? I was very close to, get to giving John Alessio that second round. That second round was tough to score. You know, do you give it to John Alessio based on the cut he opened up? He, he opened it up with jabs, but, but Diego was a lot more aggressive. He did get a takedown. It looked like he was trying to finish the fight more. Both you and Randy um, both agreed that Alessio was a little too cautious, wasn't offensive-minded enough in the second round. So um, it, the fight, to me, turned out perfectly. I thought Diego edged out a victory. Here's the end of the fight. Very unusual position. I mean, these guys, for over two minutes, Diego was hanging on to John Alessio's back. Great defense by John Alessio, and Diego just relentless in his attack. I mean, and there was no way that Diego was letting go of the back of John Alessio. He had the legs buried inside to hold control, and Diego could not take him down, could not submit him, but he may still very well get the decision victory to up his record to 17-0 lifetime in his mixed martial arts career. Glory to God, baby. And the crowd reacts to John Alessio's ability to neutralize the offense of Diego Sanchez. Diego Sanchez, John Alessio, we will have the judge's decision. And with it is Bruce Buffer. Ladies and gentlemen, after three rounds of action, we go to the judges' scorecards for a decision. The judges score it 30-27, 29-28, and 29-28 for the winner by unanimous decision, Diego Nightmare Sanchez! Let's move ahead. We are set now for light heavyweights. He of great speed, he of lethal hands. Italian-born Alessio Sakara faces an integral part of Team Punishment, Tito's team for years, who tonight hopes to leave his own mark.
Our tale of the tape brought to you by Zion's Extreme Supplements. Great taste, extreme energy. Available at GNC stores nationwide. The 24-year-old Alessia Sakara against the 30-year-old boogeyman, Dean Lister. One of the masters of team punishment. And Lister has a reach advantage, but as Randy and Joe both talked about, Lister wants this fight on the canvas as quickly as possible. My new member of the UFC family, Jenny Lee, working the octagon along with the beautiful Rochelle Leah here tonight. So we are set for Alessio Sakara and Dean Lister. Interesting to Ready? note. Come on. As Herb Dean gets these men started, that Dean Lister had David Loazzo in his corner. So Lister told all of us he's worked a lot less jiu-jitsu. He's kind of got that BJJ down, obviously, and a lot more Muay Thai to prepare for this fight. And obviously, he might even try to use his hands in reverse to defend himself against Alessio Sakara. Wow. Big right hand by is Sakara. Big right hand there by Lister. Mel Manor from the, 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 the Muay Thai trainer for Dean Lister is a very, very good trainer. I've worked with him a little bit. Talk about trade secrets to see if David Loazzo has dropped any of those elbow secrets for Dean. He of lethal elbows, David Loazzo, who was just uh, extremely tough and dedicated in his defeat for the 185-pound fight against Rich Franklin. Dean shot in for the takedown and then immediately pulled guard. He's got an excellent guard. It looks like he's working towards an Alma Plata. As you said, ground skill-wise, one of the best in the world, Joe. For sure. Unquestionably. Does he have it here, Randy? He doesn't have control of the body, though. He's got to get his arm around the back of the waist. It looks like he's using his legs rather than getting up around his waist. He's using his legs to hold him in that position. Joe, what does Alessio even try to do here? I mean, obviously he wants to free the arm, but in what fashion can he do so? He can roll out of it, he can tuck under, he can throw his right arm under and try to roll Dean Lister up, but Dean Lister's gonna wind up on top, or he can try to yank his arm out of it, which is what he's trying to do there. And he, and he does, off. so he pulls his arm out, and Lister, again, though, very comfortable in this position. He is a very dangerous guard. I mean, Dean Lister is excellent in all positions. He is a, a full, well-rounded submission specialist. Interesting character, speaks four languages, Portuguese, Spanish, she's almost fluent in French, and of course English. She grew up in several South American countries, including Venezuela and Panama. Lived in Panama during the U.S. invasion in 1989. Right in the middle of a serious combat zone, and so he didn't speak the triangle. language, he had to fight. Dean Lister setting up a triangle. You see, he controlled the right arm, he's got the triangle locked in. Now he's got to lock a hold, of, get a hold of Alessio's leg to keep him from standing up. He's done that, he broke him down. Now he's gonna either pull on the head or perhaps gonna pull on his leg and squeeze down on Alessio Sakara's head. See how he's pushing with his leg, or grabbing his hand rather, on his leg? The tap. The tap. And it's all over! It Beautiful. is all over! Dean Lister has submitted Alessio Sakara. Wow! and the ground game reigns supreme. Be beautiful, beautiful jujitsu. If you see, he grabbed a hold of Alessio's arm to control it, he got a hold of that wrist and immediately threw that leg over and locked in that triangle. Grabbed a hold of his own knee, used that to pull down and apply more pressure. Alessio was forced to tap out. You know, he has waited a long time to come uh, from behind the scenes of Team Punishment to be the man in the spotlight tonight, and Lister disappoints none including, I'm sure, his very good friend, Tito Ortiz. Take a look at how it finished here as Dean Lister wins by submission. If you look at Dean Lester's right arm, he's controlling Alessio's uh, left arm. See how he did that and he threw his leg over? He's doing that just to set up that position. Controlling that wrist, throws that triangle over, locks it in place, and then pulls, you see how he uses his right arm to pull down on his knee, applying even more pressure. He grabs that there and squeezes it tight. And Alessio is forced to tap. You see his face is just red as a plum right there. He hung on as long as he can but he realized he's gonna have to tap out. Beautiful submission by Dean Lister. That's just pure technique right there. Well, it was well advertised that he has incredible ground skills and Lister is victorious. Bruce Bumper. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Herb Dean has called a stop to this contest at two minutes, 20 seconds of the very first round. For the winner, by tap out, due to a triangle choke, the Boogeyman, Dean Lister.
You know, UFC fans, the story is well documented. A man named Elio Gracie, he, he basically created a system to allow the little man to survive in a fight against the big man. Elio Gracie is here in attendance tonight. His son, Hoist Gracie, brought that system into the octagon. Soon afterwards, he became a legend and a UFC Hall of Famer. Matt Hughes tonight wants to tell Hoist Gracie that he respects Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but times have changed. Matt Hughes tonight wants to send a message to all that the game has changed and Hoist's time is now in the past. Ladies and gentlemen, the greatest fighter to ever step into the octagon. A jiu-jitsu master, Hoist Gracie. This is the guy who single-handedly redefined martial arts in this country. He just tapped out. He just tapped out. That's amazing. Hey, here's the tap. There's the tap. That is the power of, of jiu-jitsu in action. Everything what I am is Gracie jiu-jitsu. There it is. He's tapping out. That's it. Beautiful technique by Gracie. Yes, sir. I'm not just part of the history. I am the history. He's trying to get an arm lock. He's got it. This is my house. I build it. That's it. Oh, he choked him out. What we've learned tonight is fighting is not what we thought it was. Exactly. I want to know how Matt Hughes is going to beat me. I'm curious to know that. He's talking, saying that he's going to knock me out, that he's going to take me down, ground and pound, and the judges will give it to him. I want to see that. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the greatest welterweight of all times. Let's get Look at the strength of Matt Hughes. Oh, could be the best. Something to be said about Jeanette Matt Hughes. The Graces have always said that their way is the best and you don't need to learn anything else. And I get to prove to them, you know, all of them, that they're wrong. That proves that my family were very good instructors. So to me, if you choke me out or arm bar me, it's a compliment. He's somewhat old school to where I don't think he's gonna pull a submission off. I don't think he's gonna come close. Give me time and I'll submit you. He'll break his arm. He's gonna snap his arm. He did. It looked like an arm lock. He probably broke his arm. I wanna beat him for three rounds, him stand up, barely look out of his eyes, and say, this sport has changed. That he's gonna beat me up, that he's gonna do this and gonna do that. Good, I'm glad he's very confident. The test is definitely on voice, I, I think. I mean, he's the one that's gonna have to do something to win the fight. Uh, all I gotta do is go out and not make mistakes and I'm gonna be fine. If I make a mistake, he can knock me out. If I make a mistake, he can submit me. But it go both ways. Don't make a mistake, cause I'll be right there to capitalize on that. I really think that Hoist is gonna have a rude awakening and he's either gonna need to go to school or retire. I'm gonna choke him out, I'm gonna apply a submission hold. Make him quit. Help him up, send him home. Well, Joe, in the words of Hoist Gracie, I have no idea how Matt Hughes believes he's going to beat me. How can Matt Hughes beat Hoist Gracie? First of all, Matt Hughes can beat him if he decides to keep the fight standing. I believe Matt Hughes has superior stand-up. Matt Hughes has an excellent ground game. His jiu-jitsu is just as beautiful as any Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt I've ever seen in the octagon. Matt Hughes has a variety of skills, but he's fighting a very proud man with a history of victory in the octagon. Randy Couture, we bring the natural back in. Randy, we talked a moment ago about that wrestling instinct. If you go to the ground, you go to Hoist's strength. But can Matt really, uh, can Matt resist the temptation? Can Matt stay comp composed and not get over aggressive and not put this fight on the ground because that's his background? That's the question. Can Hoist Gracie find a way to put this fight on the ground or stand with Matt and weather the storm? That's the question. For Hoist Gracie, Joe talked about it, pride. Pride not only for himself, pride for his family, pride for everything he is. That's a pretty strong motivator. Absolutely. Hoist Gracie's putting the Gracie mystique on the line in this fight. And stepping up now years later since he defeated all those big guys in the open division and going against probably the pound for the pound, the strongest guy in this sport. Hey, let's bring Joe back in real quickly to, to talk about that because Hoist Gracie says, all right, Matt, I make a mistake, you try to pounce. But if Matt Hughes makes a mistake, kid you not, Hoist Gracie can finish this fight. For sure. I mean, Hoist Gracie is a, a brilliant submission specialist. He's uh, fought guys much, much larger than him in the past. Recently submitted Akibono in Japan, who's over 400 pounds. So for sure, if Matt Hughes makes a mistake, 
Hoist Gracie can capitalize. The question is, is Matt Hughes going to make that mistake? We've only seen Matt Hughes lose a couple times by submission by Dennis Hallman, who is a very fast and explosive guy, and by BJ Penn, who first cracked him and rocked him with a punch and then took his back and submitted him. Matt Hughes can lose by submission, but he's also a guy that's shown that he really has evolved with the times, really has changed his game, and has incredibly well-rounded skills and is freakishly gorilla strong. The last time he really, truly lost by submission, Matt Hughes will tell you, was a very, very long time ago, and tonight will not be another time. Celebrity packed house, as we said here at the Staples Center. Let's get their prediction for the main event of the evening. It's tough. Uh, I'm gonna have to go with, uh, I'm gonna have to go with Matt Hughes tonight, for sure, definitely. Matt Hughes and Hoyce Gracie. Well, I'm an old schooler, you know, I'm an old timer, and you know, nobody, nobody at the UFC would even have like ground game if it wasn't for Hoyce Gracie. So, my heart's going with him. Bottom line is, I want to see a submission tonight. I think we have to remember. I think without Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, I think UFC would be incomplete. And anybody who says otherwise is a fool. So I think we owe a lot of respect to the Gracie family and what they brought. And uh, I just want to see a good fight. I like the ground game, so I, I want to see a submission. Being that they could both kick my ass, uh, I'll probably say Hoyce Gracie. Because Hoyce, uh, Royce, Hoyce, whatever, I just know he could choke anything and break any part of your body. He'll put you in a toe lock. You know, he grab your nose and do something like that. He'll put your eye in, a, in a, some kind of uh, broken eye socket trick maneuver. That boy is nasty. So, you know, I think Mark um, Hughes is big and strong, and he looked like the juggernaut without his helmet on. But I, I, I just think that Gracie just knows how to put anything in the lock. Tonight, um, Matt, Matt Hughes all the way. I've been, uh, Matt, Matt's come a long way. He's got, he's got great rounded skills. And I just think, I mean, Hoist, he's a, Hoist is a great fighter, and he's a very tough guy, but I just don't think he has the tools to beat uh, Matt, Matt Hughes. I kind of like what Mr. Wayans said. He described it in his own unique fashion. <laughs> it is time for our main event of the evening. and most influential martial artists in the history of the world. You're talking about a guy who changed everybody's perceptions about fighting. With his performances in the early UFCs, he completely redefined how everybody looks at fighting and everybody looks at what is effective in real competition, real confrontation. And he did it in the old days with no rules and no time limits. Now here he is agreeing to fight on basically completely different terms. Three five minute rounds, not nearly as much time to prepare, no gi, fighting with shorts on. This is gonna be a very, very interesting fight. Often asked, how did that little man finish off those opponents much larger? It was Gracie Jiu Jitsu. And the carrier was that man, Hoist Gracie, but he will tell you that he is not the legend Hoist will quickly say, the legend is my father, Elio. Hoist Gracie has never been submitted. He is a perfect 11-0 in the UFC.
talk about a look of confidence. Matt Hughes, extremely confident. I'm sure he's pretty happy that he doesn't have to cut that extra five pounds. There too. you go. <laughs> Trying to get that extra us. water weights on his shirt right there. <laughs> You can tell us about that. I mean, Matt Hughes is uh, probably walks around about 190 pounds and regularly cuts down to 170. How much of a difference do you think that extra five pounds is going to be? Well, I think it, more than anything, it allows him to mentally just relax a little bit. He doesn't have to worry about that extra five pounds. So, you know, that takes a little pressure off. It's a little more enjoyable. As we said right at the top of the show, when Hoist Gracie back in 1993 was defeating three opponents on the same night in four minutes and 50 seconds, Matt Hughes was pretty much pinning his way to success as an All-American wrestler from Hillsboro, Illinois. Two-time state champion in high school, high school All-American, a two-time collegiate All-American who now has redefined every fighter in the world at 170 pounds as truly the most dominant welterweight in mixed martial arts history. Yeah, you're talking about a guy who is a superior athlete, an elite athlete, who has embraced all the other aspects of fighting. Started off as a great wrestler and used that same ability and translated it into striking, translated into submissions. I mean, his submissions are just top notch. This is from a guy who originally started out with no submissions. Just a round and pound wrestler. And now he's got beautiful transitions that are as good as anybody else in the game. The history of this sport is well documented. It goes back to 1993, and tonight the past is set to face the present. Our tale of the tape for this, our main event of the evening, brought to you by Zines Extreme Supplements, Great Taste Extreme Energy, available at GNC stores nationwide. Yes, fans, he's only 39 years old. A huge reach advantage for Hoist Gracie, but we wouldn't think the stand-up game would make a difference. But long limbs mean great submission control. Matt Hughes is 32. Matt Hughes weighs in at 175 and a half, of course. This is not a title fight. It's scheduled for three five-minute rounds in the catch weight, if you will, of 175 pounds. Official introductions of this historic event from Bruce Buffer. Ladies and gentlemen, this UFC contest is sectioned by the California State Athletic Commission with Marty Keller Chairman and Executive Director Armando Garcia. Our judges at Octagon side are Richard Bertrand, Alejandro Rochin, and Cecil Peoples. And our doctor is Dr. Van Lemons. When the action begins, our referee in charge of the Octagon is Big John McCarthy. This event is sponsored by Zion's Zenergy. Zenergy, great taste, extreme energy. And Mickey's Fine Malt Liquor, the official beer of the UFC, Mickey's Got Stung. And now, two warriors have entered the Octagon. One, a UFC legend, and the other, a UFC champion. Live from Staples Center here in Los Angeles, California, it's time! This fight is a UFC catchweight contest consisting of three five-minute rounds. Introducing first, the warrior standing in the blue corner. This man is a Gracie Jiu-Jitsu fighter and is undefeated in the octagon with a professional record of 11 wins and no losses. He stands six feet, one inch tall and weighed in at 175 pounds. Fighting out of Torrance, California, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back the UFC one tournament champion the UFC 2 Tournament Champion and the UFC 4 Tournament Champion, the legendary UFC Hall of Fame Octagon Warrior, Hoist And 
And now, introducing the champion standing in the red corner. This man is an MFS elite fighter. He holds a professional record of 40 wins with four losses. He stands five feet nine inches tall and weighed in at 175 and one half pounds. Fighting out of Hillsboro, Illinois, he is considered the most dominant welterweight fighter in UFC history. Ladies and gentlemen, the undisputed UFC welterweight champion of the world, Matt Hughes. Okay, gentlemen, you receive your instructions in your locker room, driving the questions from you, Hart. Any questions from you, Matt? Fight clean, fight hard, fight fair, touch gloves, let's back. Wow. I can't believe we're gonna see this. Wow. Hoist Gracie is gonna fight Matt Hughes, and we're at the Staples Center. It is a night that will live forever. Hoist Gracie, Matt Hughes, Big John McCarthy, our referee. All right, here we go. Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's get it on. The legend has returned. Kick. Yep, Hoist has been working strikes, and, and it won't be a surprise to some of us if Hoist tries to use the high kick on more than one occasion. Hoist would love to get this down to the ground and try to use his submission power. But again, we wonder if he can do so unless Matt wants it to be there. Matt steps away. Matt would usually look immediately to shoot, but not in this case. At least that's what he told me yesterday. And nice. Matt returns with a kick. Nice leg kick by Hughes. You see Matt go into that almost explosion mode, Randy, and you expect him to be looking double leg, but he's nah, not he's, in this he's, situation. He's staying very composed. He's measuring. Answers with the kick. Matt said it's taken him a long time, but he's getting better than his longtime training partner, Pat Militich, with the hands. Said, I'm finally getting the better of Pat. Superman punch. And they tie up. Gracie understands defense better than anyone in the world. And you're talking about a guy who has fought some enormous guys in the past. He's used to having a strength disadvantage. I mean, so that, that fight with Kimo, yeah, that one with Kimo is just unbelievable. Hoist nice tried to elbow. elbow. And here we go. Hoist able to pull guard. Side control, though, here. No guard side control for Matt Hughes as they go down. Matt Hughes looks like he's looking to mount. He's got a knee on Hoist's stomach. He's going to try to push it through and mount here. That will be a definitive statement if he can mount Hoist Gracie. Matt trying to utilize the side control on Hoist. This is not a good position for Hoist to be in. He's got the far side underhook. Look for Matt to drop some elbows on Hoist here. Remember, Hoist Gracie in mixed martial arts has never been submitted. Hoist is rolling over. Looks like he's trying to... Matt did a good job of controlling him. Matt is the stronger of the two competitors on the ground here. Elbows to the body by Hughes on the top. If there is a position on the ground that Matt Hughes is comfortable in, this is one of them. For sure. Matt Hughes always wants to be on top. He is a wrestler. There's the guard. Yeah, Hoist able to get to half guard. Half nice guard job is trying to get Hoist. a guillotine on the left side. Matt powers out of it. So controls Kimura Hoist's here. arm. He's, He's got, got these are in. here in this Kimura. Can he finish? Can he wow. submit Hoist Gracie? Will Matt Hughes make history? Can he work the arm? And submit Hoist Gracie. Hoist looks calm, but this has got to be a bad position for him. Oh, ah, that arm is bent back. Ways. Matt Hughes trying to finish by submission. Wow. How flexible is Hoist Gracie? Holy His, oh, his arm is bent in a bad angle, man. It looked like it popped there. Yeah, it looked like it popped for sure. No expression on Hoist's face at all, though. 
Yeah, we don't know if he hurt his left arm there, but Matt's going to keep working on it. Wow. Trying to get guard. The brilliance of Hoist Gracie demonstrated there as it looked as if Matt Hughes was going to make history. That would have been a big statement. All right, he's passed. He's in side control again. Got him trapped here. He's got arm trapped in crucifix position. Yeah, he's done that. He loves this position. He's got his back. Wow. Now Hughes trying to work a choke. Elbows, ground and pound from the back of Hoist Gracie. Wow, he's got Stretches him flattened him out. out. Four of five minutes complete here in round one. Bad position for Gracie. Great control for Hughes. Got both legs tucked in now. Stretching Hoist out again from this double I mean, hook. Hoist is all about survival, though, guys. This is a man who's fought for hours and hours in jiu-jitsu competition. This has got to be discouraging to him no matter what. He's getting dominated on the ground here. Taking some serious punches, and he's in danger. Big John McCarthy stopping this fight. Could this be over here? Can Hoist have been Wow, it that's it. It's all over. Matt Hughes has defeated Hoist Gracie. Wow. Complete and total domination. Expressionless was Elio. And I will read you what is the most important statement ever made in the UFC. We must have a fighter who can intelligently defend himself. And at that point, Hoyt Gracie could not intelligently defend himself. He could have been inflicted with great punishment from Matt Hughes in that position. And the right decision was for John McCarthy to stop the fight. For sure, Absolutely. it's the right decision. Let's look at the replay here. Matt has him flattened out, complete control, and just dropping bombs. Laying and covering your head is not a, a terribly intelligent defense, but it's the only choice at this point. And John McCarthy stops the fight as Matt Hughes. Here's another look at it. Brutal ground and pound. Just a tight back mount and just vicious punches. Hughes utilizes his trademark ground and pound to defeat the UFC Hall of Famer. Perhaps the most amazing thing was that voice was not submitted by Matt Hughes. Bruce Buffer. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Big John McCarthy has called a stop to this contest at 4 minutes 39 seconds of the very first round. For the winner, Matt Hughes! The one thing that never happens is history leaving us because history will always be historic and he will always be a legend, Hoist Gracie, but Matt Hughes has made a statement about the present-day mixed martial artist today in defeating the legend. Pat Militich, Matt Hughes in the octagon, and here's Joe with Matt. All right, Matt, congratulations on a complete dominant victory. Is this how you expected the fight to go, and how important is this fight to you? First off, I want to thank God for giving me the power to come in here and even competing with these guys. Number two, I never thought it would be like that. Hoist is, uh, he's not used to time limits, so he was wanting to start slow, and, and uh, I'm just lucky in a lot, of, a lot of ways, and one of them, the Hoist has never had to prepare herself for three five-minute rounds. Now, uh, coming into this fight, uh, a lot of people thought that your game plan would be to try to keep it on the feet, but when it went to the ground, you seemed more than comfortable there and actually controlled the pace. Did that, did that surprise you at all? Well, uh, I train with the best team in the world, Militich, and we train ground fighting all the time. That's my boys over there if you want to get a pan at them. But uh, I, I knew I'd be fine on the ground. I did. And for sure you were. Take a look at the Mickey's replay, look up at the big screen, and talk us through the end of the fight here. Well, I didn't think much about it. And then I heard Big John say, Hoist, get out of there. And that triggered my mind to start punching because he knew the hoist was in a bad situation, so 
I pressured in, kept my hips on him so he couldn't get up, and I knew the Big John would have to do his job and stop the fight. How nice was it to not have to lose that extra five pounds? That, that 175 weight class is perfect for me. You wish they would change it? It would, wouldn't bother me. All right, now you are the champ at 170. You've got some big fights coming up. A lot, of, a lot of competition in that division, and we look forward to seeing you again. Ladies and gentlemen, the UFC welterweight champion, Matt Hughes. A great night for Matt Hughes, and Cindy Crawford approves of Hughes' dominance of the Hall of Famer, Hoist Gracie. All right, I'm here with Hoist. Hoist, you must be disappointed right now. Tell us, what are your thoughts about the fight? Of course I'm disappointed, but he is the welterweight champion. Now, you've been here from the beginning. You were the, the original victor in the UFC, in the UFC 1 tournament. Do you think that you're going to continue fighting, or do you think this is it for you? I got a couple more on me. Let me go home and heal this up. I'll be back. I'll be back. Well, the crowd loves that. And it is an honor to watch you compete again. And I've said this before, that you single-handedly redefined martial arts in this country. And seeing you again here was a pleasure. Hoist Gracie, ladies and gentlemen. Randy, Hoist is such a disciplined and, and proud man the way that Matt dominated him, does it in any way tarnish what Hoist Gracie is all about? I don't think you can ever take away what Hoist, Hoist Gracie's accomplished. What, the standard that he set in this sport, it doesn't matter what he does in here tonight. No, everybody is gonna respect him forever for, for what he's accomplished. And what does this say in your mind about how this sport has moved into the modern age? And, and we don't need to sit here and talk about the differences in the sport since back in 1993. A sold out Staples Center makes that statement for us. But there's no longer Randy Couture the wrestler or Hoist Crazy the Jiu Jitsu guy or Tank Abbott the street fighter. It's all about the mixed martial artists. Absolutely, this is the era of the mixed martial artists. Real fighters in every situation that a fight can go in, having the technical answers to deal with those positions. Hoist Gracie almost, almost had his arm suffer a similar injury, it appeared, to what Tim Sylvia suffered against Frank Mir. How did Hoist Gracie avoid the tap when Matt Hughes was working that arm? Uh, I think willpower, most of anything. I mean, he had the submission, clearly his arm was hyperextended the wrong way. He managed to rotate his elbow just enough, and, and it probably popped there. Very painful. Uh, but he's not gonna, he's not gonna tap. You can see how far that elbow has bent. Uh, it's amazing. And, uh, and there's no way he's gonna tap. Manages to roll it out. Hoist Gracie, spectacular in avoiding the submission, which would have been the first time he had ever been submitted. And the amazing thing about Hoist, and we saw it throughout the 90s, is that he, he just lacks expression. He is always so calm and composed, even tonight in defeat. Absolutely, and he showed true class, a great warrior, win or lose, and uh, I think he's gonna be respected for that. And for Matt Hughes, now he gets back to the point which is ahead, which is a young, hungry animal, and George St. Pierre and many lined up behind him. But I think this is going to be something that Matt Hughes will put on that trophy case, and this will never be taken away. I think Matt Hughes is truly honored to have fought a legend in our sport in Hoist Gracie. And, and I think he demonstrated that here tonight with nothing but respect for Hoist. If there was the perfect opponent, for Hoyce Gracie, it may very well have been Matt Hughes, Randy, for that very reason you just spoke of. Yeah, I think so. I think it, it, in a modern-day mar mixed martial artist, Matt Hughes is the perfect guy for Hoyce to fight. He's, he's going to go out. He's going to try and put you on the ground. He's going to put him where Hoyce is known for being, on his back, where he can use the submission skill. So Hoyce Gracie defeated by Matt Hughes by referee stoppage here in the first round, the celebration in the locker room of Hughes. In that celebration, middleweight champion Rich Franklin. And for Matt Hughes, it is a very special night. That moves us to our submission of the night, brought to you by our good friends at Tap Out, Tap Out Clothing Wear at InYourFace.com. Joe, our submission of the night. Submission of the night goes to Dean Lister with a beautiful triangle submission over Alessio Sakara. 
World Abu Dhabi Absolute Champion Dean Lister. See that? He just locks in that beautiful tight triangle, squeezes down on the knee. Alessio Sakara is forced to tap out with a tap out of the night. Tap out of the night brought to you by our friends at Tap Out. Tap Out Clothing Wear at InYourFace.com. The jiu-jitsu man came in, did his deal, and Dean Lister, they forced to be wrestling with now that he has made his way to the UFC. Speaking of tapping, I think we knew one thing coming in tonight. Hoist Gracie was not going to tap. And if it were any lesser man, I think John McCarthy would have stopped that fight even a bit earlier. You know what? I was uh, that straight arm bar that he had. I was really worried about that. It looked like his arm was going to break. And it was a, there was a moment where it looked like it popped. And I'm not sure if it did. But yeah, Hoist was going to let his arm break for sure before he tapped. You know, Joe, the interesting thing about tonight is that now the, uh, the past is the past. And the present is clearly the present. And the present day warrior is one that is very tough to defeat. Well, you know what? I mean, that's, that's the evolution of all sports. I mean, you, you originally have the guys who understand what's going on against, you know, guys with uh, one boxing glove who had no clue as to what was going on. And that's what we had with Hoist Gracie in the early UFCs. Now what you have with a guy like Matt Hughes, you have elite athletes, you know, who train in all aspects of the game, have superior conditioning, superior strength and explosiveness. And you see the result tonight. The interesting thing is, as we welcome back in Randy the Natural Couture, is what does Hoist Gracie do now? You and I both agreed that this does not tarnish the legend, which is Hoist Gracie, but he has been defeated for the very first time in what he says is his home. Yeah, well, he showed some stand-up, some kicks. He, he looked like he definitely been working on his stand-up yeah. skills. So yeah. he's going to, like all of us, continue to progress as a mixed martial artist. I guarantee you, as he said, he's going to be back in there. At 39 years old, there is no doubt in your mind, young man, that he can continue to succeed. Yeah, I don't think age is an issue here. I don't think it's passed him by. Technical, yes, he has technical issues that he's going to continue to sort out. He's a warrior. He's going to be back in the cage. He certainly is, and a man who knows very well about that, Randy Couture. And, you know, Joe, you could see, again, the lack of expression on the face of Hoyce Gracie, but that is the master in which he is. And even in defeat, he, he never showed any type of disappointment. No, that's, uh, you know, Hoyce is a warrior. He's a very proud guy. I mean, he's not going to wince in pain. He's not going to, you know, quit early. He, he gutted it out, and he did what he was capable of doing. But unfortunately, you know, he was there against a guy who's much stronger, Stronger, much bigger, much more athletic, much more explosive, and a guy who is more evolved. That point being said, he showed no emotion to the fans here inside the Staples Center, but when he got back into the solitude of his locker room, the emotion started to pour over for a very disappointed Hoist Gracie. I, I, I don't know if that's Hoist's daughter or who that is, but yeah, I mean, Hoist is... Uh He's obviously very dejected and very disappointed. And I mean, if he does want to continue fighting, he has to stop and think about how much work he's going to have to do to try to catch, I mean, catch up to even guys who are not as good as Matt Hughes. It's, uh, it's a very difficult road ahead if he chooses to take it. Elio Gracie was the man who brought it here to our country. Hoist Gracie was the man who delivered the message in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu will live forever because of the Gracie family, and for that, Hoist should always be remembered as a true Hall of Famer. For sure, and like I've said many times, he is the guy who single-handedly, with his victories, redefined the way people look at fighting, and he is one of the most famous and influential martial artists in the history of the world. Joe, thank you very much. Randy, the natural couture, pleasure to have you in the broadcast booth tonight, Thanks, and uh, we will see you again down the road. Absolutely. All right, a wonderful night indeed. It's History was made tonight as the torch was passed from the legend to the soon to be legendary Matt Hughes. So we are set to bid farewell to beautiful Los Angeles, California. But as I mentioned earlier, it will be a very busy summer for the Ultimate Fighting Championship. And it begins with the Ultimate Fighter 3 finale, Saturday, June 24th, live from the joint at the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino. Two more six-figure contracts will be awarded. Kenny Florian fights Sam Stout in the main event, live on Spike TV. Now also live on Spike TV, just four days later, it's Ultimate Fight Night Live, Wednesday, June 28th. The headliner that night, Chris Lieben against Anderson Silva. Then UFC 61 Bitter Rivals comes your way from the Mandalay Bay Event Center, Saturday, July 8th, Ortiz Shamrock 2. Sylvia Arlovsky again for the Heavyweight Championship. Tickets go on sale tomorrow. And don't forget for all the post-game reaction to tonight's activities here from the Staples Center, you can log on right now to UFC.com, that's UFC.com, for post-fight interviews. 
a sold-out Staples Center here in beautiful Los Angeles, California. A night that will go down in UFC history. Many were victorious, many victorious in different ways. A flying knee here from Spencer the King Fisher, the beautiful Rochelle Leah. A victory lap eventually would come from Melvin Gillard, our executive producers, Frank Fertitta III, Lorenzo Fertitta, and UFC President Dana White. Our supervising producer is Craig Borsari. Our coordinating producer, Tim O'Toole. Producer, Bruce Connell. Director, Anthony Pasquale Giordano. And our technical producer is always Alan Connell. Joe Silva, the matchmaker, brought us some great, great events here tonight. Some great masterful jiu-jitsu and guillotine chokes like that one from Brandon Vera. Then it was John Alessio against the legend, which is the ultimate fighter, one middleweight champion, Diego Sanchez. Diego was frustrated, but in the end, he came away with the win. Time now for Dean Lister to step out of the shadows of Team Punishment and Tito Ortiz and into his own line light. Did he enjoy it? I guarantee you he did. And then it was history. Hoyts Gracie against Matt Hughes. John McCarthy said, let's get it on. History was made, Hoist was back, and then Hoist was defeated. So long from Los Angeles, everybody. A lot of people keep telling me that I cannot do this. My first UFC that I watched, Hoist against Severn. Just my mentality, but I thought I could beat Hoist. And that was back in probably 93. He just proved great jiu-jitsu style. You can survive somebody much bigger. I fought a guy who was six foot eight, 490 fought, pounds. Four fights in one night. When it comes night. time in that octagon, my wrestling will naturally take over and I'll take him down. Now it's just for the challenge. Three rounds, five minutes. No gi, judges, it's not my favor. Let the fighters, the fighters decide, decide who is the best fighter. You get a pound allowance too, right? Yeah, I'm gonna go over to the next door and, yeah. and weigh on that scale. Okay. That other one over there, if you lean forward, it goes up. If you lean back, this one's more more true. I'm trying to think. I'm thinking moves ahead. I'm trying to figure out why this hand is right. Why is this hand right here? A lot of people wanted me to go places for this fight to train, and I said, no, I, I, I don't want to. I want to stay at home. I've got kind of what I need in my I've got my friends there. We got my great camp. You know, we have four world champions that walk in and out of those doors about every day. So, I mean, how can you compare with that? You ready for a workout, Pinion? You don't have that slow Spencer now. You got me. <laughs> I think I'm ready to start now. <laughs> Another big part of that was my boxing coach, Matt Pinion. Uh, we went over, he came up with a, with a great plan on our feet. <laughs> Are you reading it? <laughs> well, I always want to work on my weaknesses. And if I'd say I had a weakness, it would be my stand-up. Yeah, we've definitely been working on trying to uh, keep it standing up here for this particular fight. Um, we've been actually working on this probably for about um, the second trig fight, actually. Um, we've been really emphasizing a lot of stand-up. It's just that this has been one of the first matches uh, where the matchup itself can um, uh, give us an opportunity to, to demonstrate what he's been working on this last year and a half. Nice. Give me four. Good. I don't think there's anybody that can really compare with us um, as far as intensity and how hard we train. Uh, and I say that pretty much for anybody in the world. <laughs> Woke up about 8 o'clock this morning. Um, the certified scale was over at the workout area at 9.30. Went over there at 9.30. Oh, 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 oh. You like that? I wish I was heavier. <laughs> Didn't need or drink anything this morning yet. Went over to the workout area, checked my weight, 
I'm a pound over right now, which is great for me, but I get to weigh 176, so I'm actually going to try to make weigh 175 and not use that extra pound. I, I kind of want to have one. Okay. Do I have to put it on, though? Yes. Well, no. Here you go. <laughs> Anything else you want, Your Highness? I want a hug. You got one that you got to put on somebody's wrist, don't you? Good on style. <laughs> This makes you. This makes you a contender. Joey. Look at you, Joe Head. Yeah. What do you say? Thanks. But make sure you get your license when you get to the weigh in the day, okay? <laughs>
Quem tem o nosso trem curto? Eu tomava porque tem pressa. Tem que esperar a hora de ganhar. É bom para o dia antes da luta, para pegar seus brains e falar com ele, e ouvir algumas outras histórias, algumas coisas que ele fez, porque o que ele fez pode não ser feito de novo. Isso é a história. É uma it's legenda right aqui. Então, os homens... That's the reason why the UFC is here today. He started to go out to him. Não, eu prefiro como está sendo no momento. Cada um usa o jeito que pode, né? Só que o nosso vale tudo é baseado no jiu-jitsu, né? Eu considero o jiu-jitsu nem só a mais eficiente como a mais completa das artes marciais. He had a very long career. His last fight, he was 55. So I'm, I'm about 40. I wish I can last as long as him. I'm just headed to my workout right now, so. I'm liking it. You know, with me fighting, I've got uh, four or five people here. Jeremy Horn's fighting, so he's here with some guys. Spencer Fisher from our team is fighting, so he's here, and he's brought a couple of guys himself. So uh, I just like it. I like the fact of having you know, a big practice group when we go over and work out, and, and then uh, a lot of, you know, somewhat fellowship time here. Don't try and advance your position at all. Have left here? Yeah. Matt's just been a madman in the gym. I mean, there isn't anybody that can hang with him right now. He's just been in phenomenal shape for over a month now. So he's just beating everybody up in the gym. I feel sorry for us, for what Matt's gonna do to him. You know, he's actually got a grudge, grudge against him. You know, Gracie's had that name, and, and he actually wants to put that name to rest. I don't know that this will really cement the fact that I'll be the best welterweight in UFC history. I'm taking this fight just so I can show people that you've got to be well-rounded nowadays and that Gracie Jiu-Jitsu is probably not the only thing you need to win fights. I'm just coming down right in the front of Staples Center. I can see Staples Center sign right here. When you guys step out and step up on the scale, it's the fighter and one person going up on the scale, please. You guys get up on the scale, you check your weights when you guys get off the scale, you're going to do a face-off for the photographers. As I said before, tomorrow night is when you get paid, so that's when you save that for tomorrow night. Please. Any questions at all? I'll go tomorrow in your locker room, we'll go over anything. Think about if you have any questions. Think about what you're yeah, actually look, If you do what you just said you do, I think it'll be a good fight. Yeah. <laughs> you're both twisted in the USC. You're kind of big. The larger. It's way too big. No, no, it's not that too big. They're all tight the same right here. They all the same pressure over here. I was looking for the pressure, because okay. the other ones... The do these things not... stay here till tomorrow? I have them, yeah. I'll get the They're under my control. Okay, I will have your gloves. I'll bring them in to you tomorrow. Okay. Oh, so I cannot take it home and put some lead inside? And... Well, a horseshoe maybe. Horseshoe. Okay. Yeah, horseshoe is good. <laughs> <laughs> There's still a generation in there, pal. <laughs> coach Clem, Lincoln College wrestling coach. It's where, it's where we went to school. It's where we went to school. Lincoln College. See all those grades. It's from Matt and I. <laughs> Of course, I respect him that he was a fighter. If I didn't respect him, I wouldn't be fighting him. I mean, the guy's definitely worth a opponent. If it wasn't worth it to fight him, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here today. It's not that I don't respect him, you know, but he's, he's just an opponent. I could care less about his last name. I could really care less about what he did in the UFC 10 years ago. Um, I don't know that I'm going to gain any satisfaction from beating Hoist Gracie, Gracie, other than he's just a typical opponent. I can't say that I've ever uh, not taken a fight. Uh, you know, I think being the champion, you've just got to take whatever the UFC gives you. Three days before Dana uh, made this public announcement about me and Hoist, he called me up and said, hey, 
I've got your next opponent. I said, who is it? He goes, Hoist Gracie. I said, well, I'll, st I'll start training. If they only knew that I didn't really start myself. <laughs> <laughs> I took this fight because I like challenges. Matt Hughes is one sleep put up Matt Hughes. That's a definite challenge for me. So I like challenges. I like when people tell me I cannot do it. Dude has been served. Oh, man. Man. Tuna, top two. Tuna, tuna cheese, tuna. avocado. I cook myself, man. I'm cook. I'm the cooker. I'm the chef. That is. The time I be with him for the last month, I see him very, very focused and he very straight in his training. He don't miss the training. He don't say I'm tired. I'm this. I'm that. You know, he don't give excuses. If you tell him to go one more, he go. But um, like I say, besides the focus, he have the family to help him. You know, he have the friends, the good partners training, and you know, what else you need. One thing we learn from the family, we don't have obligation to do nothing. And that's make us more comfortable. We are a fighter, not because my father pushed us to be a fighter. We are a fighter because we like to be there. We like to train, we like to roll, we like to be in the match. I think I prefer be a fighter, use the gi, and then be a, I don't know, lawyer with the suit. The academy is an extension for my house, for Hoist house. You know, we talk all the time about this, like sometimes, like sometimes in the breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You know, <laughs> and sometimes between the meals, we're still talking about, you know, and some friends come and say, can you say, and always talking about Jiu Jitsu, you know, that's where life, you know. I tried to put a couple of tears on the, on, the, on the mat before the match every time. It's just me to me that I'm not thinking about going home that night. To your house, buddy. decision. I uh, just got done with the weigh-in. Uh, gonna get something to eat here in a little bit. I had a banana and apple right after weigh-in, so get some solid food in me and um, relax the rest of the night. And um, that's it. So this is WWE. Let's get this out. Yeah, this is what I, was, I mean. This this could work in a fight. Uh, Jeremy Horns uh, hit it. Mock uh, Sato was hit this in, in a fight. But I mean, just not real it's the collar tie here. Now, just hold me, hold me up. You're talking to a basketball player, man. Now, now hold me up, okay? Because I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump up and one leg's gonna go over here and one leg's gonna go over here. And, and man, you just, you just gonna hold me up. So, so here I am. <laughs> I think you would win with that move. It's, um, it's fight night, it's about a half an hour before I have to go over there, so I should have uh, food coming at any time. I'm um, just here with my family and, and a few friends uh, getting ready. I just packed my bag, uh, getting ready to head over. We're here and we're going to leave at the hotel at 4. <laughs> I'll see you downstairs. Is there one that's playing, buddy? This is. Mark, we're going to have to go anytime. Bye -bye,
I'm not even hungry. I'm Felt like I just ate. Are you hungry? You want to eat this turkey? No, I'm not hungry. And I, I'll, you know, if I get hungry in an hour, I'll eat some of that turkey sandwich. And you know. Love you. Joey, give me a hug and a kiss, buddy. Cause I got to go to work. Uh, uh. Oh! See you up in the stands. Okay. Ready, man? Feel like a circus. Can you find a cover shot in there somewhere? <laughs> yeah. Is there a game in it or something? Lakers playing? <laughs> This makes Vegas look like I mean, no big deal. It's you know? crazy. Alright. No, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> As soon as I get to the arena, I like to go and get a break of my sweat in the octagon before the fight even starts. Feel it out. That way, when I step in there for the first time right before the fight, um, I, I won't feel like I haven't been in there in a little while. So, um, then go back in the locker room after I warm up as soon as I get there and, and uh, chill out with my buddies. I've got two of the guys on the card uh, for my team, so it should be should be nice. We'll have a, a room full of people. Hey, what's going on at Standard? What's going on at Standard? Why does it matter? Michael Duncan's party. Michael? Yeah, you didn't Michael get a, you, weren't no. you weren't invited? You weren't invited? No. I'm going to give a shit. I'm going to say no, I'm not going. <laughs> Tell him the same thing for me. He didn't invite you either? Nope. Oh, I'm going to bust his Michael, this is Tim Sylvia. How soon we forget. I'm sitting here with Matt Hughes and Rich Franklin, and Rich has been invited to your after fight party, and Matt and I haven't. Know nothing about it. Nothing about it until just now. That, that's that's some messed up shit, man. I thought, thought, thought I was your boy. We're rolling deep. We got a lot of guys in here right now. It's, and Matt, you know, we're just a big family. And we like to have fun and raise hell, and that's what we're doing until fight time. What, how, come, how come Matt and I didn't get an invite? It's Michael, Matt. What's up with that? How come Rich got one? We we didn't. All right, well, I'll talk to you when you come here. Yeah, we're going to bust his b when he gets here, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> I just got started back reading the New Testament again, so I'm on uh, John right now, so I'll read a couple chapters in John and, and nothing nothing real specific. Um, just uh, get my mind off kind of what's going on and, and the surrounding and, and uh, get a couple, couple uh, chapters down in the Bible. Everybody's welcome to have bended knee. Dear Heavenly Father, these guys really want to win. I could never go through what they go through on a daily basis. But you know, Lord, you know where their hearts are. You know how hard they work, and there's a reason. It's because they want to be the best. Lord, we pray tonight that you would touch these men and that they would walk out there and be the best. And in Jesus' name, we pray and ask these things. Amen. Guys, who picked me up, come over here, arrive in the locker room, just sit down, go to sleep until it's time to warm up. I'm not here to beat him up. I'm not here to try to prove anything. Being there, done that. Now I want to see, cause he's talking a lot. I want to see how he's gonna beat me. I cannot see that. I was in this corner. He fought Sakuraba for an hour and 45 minutes. He came to me in the fourth round. I jumped in the ring and he said, no, no, I broke my ankle. He gave me three rounds after that. It's not a question never giving up. I've, I've been the longest, second longest fight in history. There was an hour and 45. My father fought for three hours and 45 minutes. Grace Jiu-Jitsu is a self-defense art. So yes, I am going to have to be very patient. <laughs> Spencer yeah. started off, boys. This locker room all day. All Dude, you're going to get hurt before you're time to play. It's not my time. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, Rowan, let's get excited for this fight. Come on. Yeah. Come on, Jeremy. Come on, Dig come on, deep. Come on, come on. He's got the leg. He's got the leg. Got the leg. Keep the hips in. Go. Squeeze the knee. Squeeze the knee, Jeremy. Squeeze the knee. Squeeze the knee. Squeeze the knee. Squeeze the knees. Squeeze the knees. Pull him down. Pull him down. Nice. Oh, got it. Uh -huh. Come on. He's tapping. I bet he's never done that before, too. <laughs> <laughs> Show backstage. I like you guys up there. I like that. Jamie Hart! Good job! You had a story, I teach that one all the time. I just don't use it very often, because when you do it a little wrong, you end up breaking the guy's nose. It's all you now. <laughs> Matt Hills, he's been dominating the welterweight division. He is very strong and works very hard. Hey, the guy couldn't be a better challenge. Matt Hughes has a great base. He's a wrestler. He's a he's an experienced fighter, and he's the reigning champion. Period. I know he looks like a truck, but uh, Hoist is gonna be the sniper. <laughs> and that's what we're looking for, shoot the tire. Uh, I always give the example of the crocodile or the boa constrictor. The boa always prevails. And that's Hoist. Hoist is trying to lose a boa. Well, when Hoist was in the UFC, you know, when he won the first two tournaments, um, you know, it was really, there was a lack of talent there. Hoist was really the only one that brought technique into it. Uh, everybody else was kind of a street fighter. So uh, the, the sport has changed so much and the, it's evolved to where everybody's well-rounded. Everybody knows a little bit about everything. There you go, man. Good job, buddy. Set this up. No, it's right there. Me as a wrestler gives me a great advantage. I get to pick where the fight's going to be. If I'm fighting a guy like you know, a pro boxer, I'll use my stand-up uh, to take him down and beat him on the ground. If I'm fighting somebody like Boyce, you know, I could use my stand-up Defensively, keep the fight on our feet and beat him on his feet. Good. This week's fight. Good. Let's go, Matt. Good job. Good, good job. I believe that you have to have a background. I'm a great jiu-jitsu background. Yes, I do learn the stand-up styles more as a complement what's missing on, on my fighting game. But my background is great jiu-jitsu different than some fighters today. They grow up learning a little bit of everything, but they don't master any. You gotta have one game plan. We've seen him pick up guys and walk across the octagon and take him down and slam him down. So our primary goal is not to be picked up. And um, go to the ground and submit him. As soon as it hits the ground, I'm gonna think, you know, if I get in, in any trouble whatsoever, I'm just gonna stand up and, and disengage and be back on his feet. He could take me down and get on top of me, but uh, to be honest, I'm not that worried about it. Uh, uh, I think my ground game is, is really improved. Do I think he can out-trick me? No, I don't. I think he needs for me to make a mistake, you know, and I don't make that many mistakes nowadays on the ground. Boyce's weaknesses would probably be his stand-up, um, his lack of power with his hands and, and kicks. Um, he is a little bit too methodical on the ground. Um, it's not going to be a, a grappling match. It's going to be a, a fight. So, I mean, he's going to have to contend with my elbows, my punches, my knees. Hoist is blessed with something called timing. You cannot teach someone timing. And so we just watch tapes of Matthews and study the tapes and we have a plan. There's some stuff that he does that I plan on counter that. Like I said, Grace Jesus is a, is a defensive art. I'm not here to beat him up. I never said that I was going to beat him up. I'm here to see how he's going to beat me. So I want to see that. I'm curious. That's why my father created this whole thing out of pretty much the hey, curiosity. He considered himself the best fighter in the world. At his time, he was the best one. And so 
He wants to see how can big guys, how can somebody else from a different style beat him. He didn't believe on that. And I'm on the, I have the same thoughts. No, you don't want to wrap your hands? No. Okay. He's 39 years old, and I think he's just rewriting history today. Just the fact that he's going to step back into the octagon after being gone for seven years. He's rewriting history. Showtime, baby! Try to be yours, brother. He has no idea what's about to happen. This old man back where he belongs. Right? Oh, there you go. Well, if I say I'm not nervous, you know, it's I'm liar to you. I actually I'm being more nervous outside and then the time I'm inside. I think he's much more relaxed because he's inside, he don't care about nothing than I myself outside. For sure, I'm much more nervous. Heart rate, it's about walking the ring, about 80. The automatic pilot takes over. There's no thinking, no thoughts. It's just, I sit down in the seat and I watch the show. I'm usually a little nervous when they're leading me out uh, to the octagon. Um, I think everybody has, you know, got butterflies in their stomach. And, um, you know, it's finally time to get in there and, uh, and to go. When I get out to the octagon, before I go up and get in the cage, I give all my corner men a hug. You know, they shut that gate, and what I do, you know, when Hoist and I will be standing there is I'll pace back and forth. And uh, I seem to get a lot better after they shut the gate. Fight clean, fight hard, fight fair, touch gloves, let's go back. You know, as soon as the first punch is thrown, whether it's his or mine, doesn't matter. Uh, I'm fine. Uh, I, I'm working on reactions there and uh, just seeing my opponent and reacting to what he's doing. So I really don't have to think about much after the first punch is thrown. Like that, seriously. Get this stupid belt on me before somebody calls me Tim. Hey, hey. <laughs> I just happen to wear my with pride, that's all. I like it. He did real good on the on standing. I didn't think that he would flick that much stuff at me. He threw a couple front kicks to my face, um, which didn't didn't really hurt it didn't hurt me or, or bother me, but I was just I had it in my mind that if something happens, he's close enough to hit me. So I had to close gap real quick and the stand up didn't go the way I wanted. He just really didn't have anything for me on the ground and I'm not trying to, I'm not dissing Hoist when I say that, but I just think I work with, with the best team in the world and, and because I train with the best, that, that puts us all at that level. So uh, I think Hoist is a great guy, I think he, he's a great Jiu Jitsu guy, but you know maybe the, the three five minute rounds is not his game. Eu acho que as regras existentes, como a de lutar com rounds de cinco minutos, é para quem não quer ver o resultado. There's a point in my performance. The best thing I learned from my father is not to be lazy. Anything is possible. And may you continue to bless Matthew in the purpose that you have for him. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Woo! I want another one of them sometimes. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.